Yeah, we are. We are in fact. There we are. Where's my there we are and there's David okay we are broadcasting right now uh so for all of you guys that are watching out there I'm not going to send you an emoji okay here we go uh, uh we are live uh from Mount Wilson Observatories Museum uh and uh, we're also live from David Levy's home in Vail, Arizona. For those of you who do not know David, David is a prolific uh, discoverer of comets and minor planets. And he's written over, I think he's written, his, is it true, your 40th book, David? Uh, it's about 40. About 40, yeah, so a lot of books. Tons and tons of articles in magazines. Uh, um, you know, he was, uh, I think, science editor for Parade Magazine. Uh, he's been on PBS television, science programs, uh, all kinds of things. And um, uh, but what's wonderful about David uh, to the average person is that he's a very warm individual, uh, a very approachable, uh, and to anybody who's interested in astronomy, he's ready to talk about it. Uh, he loves to introduce uh, the skies and viewing through telescopes and concepts of astronomy to people of all ages. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful to have David Levy here with us today to kick off our 60 inch star party here at Mount Wilson. So I'll turn it over to you, David. Well, thank you very much, Scott, and it's, it is wonderful to be here. I dearly wish I could be with you in person, but I'm sure, as you all know by now, my wife, Wendy, died last a couple of weeks ago on the 23rd of September. We had the funeral on the following Wednesday, and uh, the shiva has just ended. We had Yom Kippur, and uh, here we are. So I'm hoping that next year when we the next time you do a Mount Wilson thing I will be with you in person. Uh, the building of Mount Wilson is one of the primary pieces of astronomical construction that took place in the 20th century. I don't think I know I don't think when they were building it that it was quite as <clears throat> seen as quite as um, epochal as it turned out to be. But, uh, you know, I'm sure you, in one of these talks today, you will see pictures of the, uh, of the uh, mules taking things up in the old trucks, taking the frame and the mirror for the 100-inch Hooker telescope. But they had an opening. <clears throat> Actually, the 100-inch was, um, was the largest telescope in the world at the time. Actually, it uh, follows, almost follows the uh, Lord Ross telescope that was opened in the mid 19th century. I think that's something like a 70 something inch telescope in Ireland. And Lord Ross used that to make his famous sketch of the Whirlpool galaxy that I believe was the inspiration for Vincent van Gogh's background in his famous Starry Night painting. And uh, <clears throat> those of you who are familiar with the, with, uh, the song Vincent by Don McLean, uh, that is one of the pieces that talks about Vincent van Gogh's life based on the Starry Night painting. Anyway, for a while, the uh, 70, I believe the 74, two inch telescope at uh, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Canada was for a two month period in 19, 
18, I believe, the largest telescope on the planet. And then in the later spring of 1918, the 100 inch was open and that became the largest telescope until Hale again, 200 inch, and that became the largest telescope on the planet. <clears throat> anyway, they had a big opening and uh, the evening the telescope was open and they decided to have first light on the um, telescope and the image they got was absolutely useless. I mean, the star could not focus, it didn't do anything, and they were really very disappointed until I believe Hale himself said, you know, the, the building's been open all day, the roof of the dome has been open, maybe the telescope just needs a little time to cool off. And so they just let it sit, they let it cool off. Around three o'clock in the morning, they came back. By this time, Vega was high in the sky and they focused the telescope on Vega and they got the finest image of Vega that anyone had ever seen. The telescope instantly was a great success. At the opening ceremony, they had a lot of scientists, a lot of, um, of visitors, a lot of uh, financial people and one poet. They had invited Alfred Noyes to come to the opening and he came to it. And uh, this is what he wrote as from that in his poem, Watchers of the Sky. Tomorrow night, so wrote their chief, we try our great new telescope, the 100 inch. Your Milton's optic tube, which you might remember from Paradise Lost, has grown in power since Galileo, famous, blonde, blind and old, talked with him in that prison of the sky. We creep to power by inches. Europe trusts her giant 40 still. Even tonight, our own old 60 has its work to do. And now our 100 inch, I hardly dare to think what this new muzzle of ours may find. And thank you and back to you, Scotty. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Any questions at all for... Uh... For David? No question. You have a question. When was the last time you were at Mount Wilson? I believe it was about just before the pandemic started. So it was probably in 2019. Yeah. And that would be my guess. Scotty met me at the airport. We had a nice dinner, drinks and everything. And then we got up here. And I'm really looking forward to getting back there in person, possibly next year. Okay. Another question. Okay. The question is, what's it like to discover a comet? That's a very good question. Uh, I think the best way of answering it is to tell you when I found my first comet in 1984 and uh, the, what is it like? The answer is one field of view. For uh, 19 years, I had been searching the sky for comets, field after field after field. And the, uh, the, the, um, and it was all the same. I found a comet early in 1983 that had been discovered already, an independent discovery. But <clears throat> after I was moving on the night of November 13th, 1984, I had the telescope moving from field to field and field. And every field was a failure. And then I moved one more field over and I saw NGC 6709, some of you may be familiar with that, and right next to it, a fuzzy patch. That turned out to be Comet Levy-Rudenko, my first comet. So the difference between a failed comet hunting program and a successful one is a single field of view. And I think I should leave, trying to leave the emotion out of it, because there's an awful lot of that involved 
I remember taking a walk down to the end of our street late that night, totally unable to sleep. And I kind of felt like I had been climbing a, a cliff, a very strong cliff for all those 19 years. And finally, I had my fingers of my left hand at the top of the cliff, and I was just pulling myself over. And that's really how I felt that night. Good question. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, David. Um, I think we'll um, move on to some more speakers here. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you get a good night of uh, observing tonight. And, um, and we'll be back uh, with Global Star Party, probably not next week, but the week after. And we'll be ready for uh, doing a big Global Star Party. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. See you then. Take care and enjoy your day at Mount Wilson. Take care. Thanks. Okay. All right. So since we have uh, Ansel Puri and Cameron Gillis here, I think you're all set, ready to go. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So Ansel Puri will come on. Uh, Ansel is uh, an architect, uh, an amateur astronomer, astrophotographer, and um, he's been on our Global Star Party, which is a live presentation that we do where I bring in astronomers from around the world uh, via Zoom and we broadcast back out to the world. So we have audiences in both hemispheres, uh, in Asia, Europe. Um, so it's a lot of fun. We have people chatting uh, live with us and we're answering their chats as they come through. Um, several of the people in this room have been on Global Star Party, including Mike Wiesner, Cameron Gillis, um, uh, Ansel Puri, and uh, Claude Plymate, and I think Teresa Plymate might have been on one, but Claude's participated in some of the very early live programs that I did. In fact, I think he did the very first one. So uh, yeah, so I get to experiment on them. So it was a lot of fun. And Tom Meneghini has also been on Global Star Party with us as well, so. Um, Okay, so Cameron, uh, we are going to do this. Let me fix this. I have to pin this up here. Spotlight that for everybody. And you can come up here and then when you share, it will come up. Okay, thank you very much. And so Puri. Thank you, Scott and Explorer Scientific and everyone. You know, this is really a pleasure and just I'm very grateful to be here. This is a, a temple of astrophysics and, you know, just this incredible to have the opportunity to present. So let me, you know, hopefully this is going to work. Uh, give me a second. By the way, before the night's done, we'll all <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Something's up. All right, this is going to work. It's good. I think there is a slight lag, but but uh, it, today is the, the Explorer Alliance event at Mount Wilson. And the title of my talk is Through the Looking Glass. So that's, as you all know, it's uh, from Alice in Wonderland. And I do believe this is a rabbit hole. Uh, you know, I would just like to say that ever since I was young, I've always been uh, really amazed by the, the skies above us. When I was a kid, uh, back in late 70s, um, lying down in the front yard, you know, with, with my dad at night, I remember this this incredible view of uh, of the night sky with with stars from edge to edge, and it was completely silent. And for me, it was you know the feeling was almost like this is a spaceship. You know, we are there are the controls. You know, I I'm like you can see the from top to bottom, left to right, it's all. Uh, you know, a, a humongous cockpit. 
And I remember, you know, sharing this with my dad and, and he obviously added to the fantasy without really giving up the, the real thing. <laughs> uh, but that's where really, I think my, my wonder and love for the night sky began. And I have to say that, uh, you know, that uh, like, as I've, I've studied more and uh, gotten exposure from Scott and team, it just is is even more uh, of a fantasy. You know, it never uh, ceases to amaze. So let me go to the next slide. So I have to say, I think my real journey in astrophotography started in August of 2020. So almost like two and a half years ago when I got this big package in the mail, it was uh, the ED-140, the Explorer Scientific Telescope. Uh, I, you know, in the world of, uh, how should I put it, uh, the, the global supply chain challenges. This was the first thing which got to me and I was super excited. Um, and this is really the looking glass, you know, the big piece of glass uh, staring back and I just was in shock for a few few weeks. You know, I, I made like a bunch of photo ops. I think this is the best one. Uh, I, I started a new job at, at a local architecture firm at that time and and this is my mugshot, uh, which they introduced me with, uh, to their staff. So this was a time, again, because of supply chain issues, there was no mount available. And, and I, you know, Jupiter was like really bright and, and shiny. And I took out a ladder. I just couldn't wait. Opened the ladder, uh, took out on the bucket shelf. I placed a blanket and placed this telescope, like this cannon. And just everything was shaking. And I pointed this to Jupiter. And I was just blown away. I mean, you could see four moons and clear bands of Jupiter. And I, I just, I think the, the whole thing shook because of the shock I got. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so patiently waited for a few more months when my mount arrived. So this is uh, a computerized go-to mount. And and I just jumped right in, opened up the box and, and I think tried a few hit and trial how to connect the camera at the uh, end of the, the scope. So I think in the middle, you can see the picture where uh, that was my first attempt and a couple of mentors of mine whom I had you know, met through cloudy nights mentioned to me, no, 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 that's not how you do. So the center uh, evolved into onto the left side uh, and this, I think, resolved a uh, little bit of issues with the imaging train, but as I saw uh, during first light. And then finally, I also got uh, an eyepiece. This is a zoom eyepiece, I believe, from uh, Bear. Um, so slowly progressing over uh, a couple of months here from December 2020 through uh, Feb of 21. Uh, but during this time, uh, the great conjunction happened with uh, where you could see Jupiter and Saturn in the same uh, view. And I, at that time, I uh, was still figuring out how to uh, install the camera. So I just pointed my cell phone, with the, the smudgy uh, uh, camera of the cell phone and got this shot. But the, I mean, what you saw through your eyes was actually much more powerful. They were almost like little earrings hanging in space and uh, it's quite a sight. And then I uh, finally, I think, succeeded in getting the shot of, of the moon, a crescent moon, uh, through the, the, my uh, color camera. It's a Canon EOS RA, which I purchased. So it's a mirrorless camera, and I was lucky to get the shot. This was, I think, pretty probably about uh, uh, half a second or, or less. But this was my kind of my first light through the camera. And then as, as I was uh, progressing and discovering more of, of the, the things to attach to the scope, I purchased a bino viewer. So this device here uh, to convert uh, mono vision into a stereo vision and pointed this to the moon. And I just got blinded, you know, the, the sheer light of the moon was uh, a new discovery for me. And I, I heard something called, there's a uh, like a moon filter. 
which I finally purchased like a like a Ray Ban in front of you know a shiny uh, surface. So that helped, and then finally, I think I'm. This is in my backyard, trying to get hold of the uh, the apparatus and and moving on to the next steps. At this stage, I had no idea that you know attaching a a strap would cause vibration. Uh, but I was just happy to be here. And this is my my very first image which I got of a deep sky. So this is uh, just a single thirty second sub of the Orion. And you know, suddenly the angel is is starting to show, and I was just super excited. So this is uh, you can see a little bit of blue uh, uh, sheen here, and that's because of a broadband light pollution filter which I purchased at the time. Um, then the thing started to open up slowly. So this is these are twelve of the those subs, and I uh, learned stacking at the time, like Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, this is a total of six minutes uh, uh, integration time on the Orion. And at that time, I also had got in touch with a really uh, good astrophotographer. He's on the East Coast. His name is Jim. And Jim was instrumental in helping me sort of uh, you know, go uh, on, on the steps faster. Um, and this finally, I think, finally getting better. So this is like a 45 minute shot of Orion. And I posted this to my office uh, page and people are just falling left and right. Because, um, but really happy to be here. So this was in March of 21. Uh, so a little over a year and a half uh, ago. And then finally I'm progressing here with the, the scope attached to the mount. And by that, this time I had learned how to do star alignment. Um, so I think I was doing three star alignment um, and also found a, a, something called a cam ranger. It's kind of an intervalometer. Before this, I was just pressing the button on the camera and just running away, you know, 30 second lag. Uh, but but this gave me, gave me the ability of controlling this via a phone or an iPad. It creates a sort of an, a Wi-Fi signal. It attaches to the, the shoe of the camera and it has all of the functions of a typical intervalometer. So this is in my backyard. Um, things are starting to look up for me. I bought a small uh, uh, power bank um, and on my way. So a few things I learned just going into a few technical steps here. So Cam Ranger, as I just mentioned, I was trying to starting to get a good polar alignment through the polar scope was not really using a pole master or any other device at that time. I was not doing any guiding, was not doing any dithering, and there was no autofocus. I was just using my hand to focus and not really using any darks. I mean, these, these concepts are completely alien to me in April of 21. Um, but eventually, got my first galaxies. So this was also in April. And on the left, you see Whirlpool, which I believe is 25 million light years away. And uh, the needle on the right side, which is about 30 or 50 million, I believe, 50 million light years. And you know, you, these smudgy shapes uh, were a big uh, moment for me, a moment frozen in time. <laughs> Um, just really happy to be able to you know, reach here and, and achieve this level. Uh, from a light polluted uh, middle of LA city, bottle eight or nine uh, uh, environment. Now I'm starting to get a little bolder and I uh, was trying to uh, uh, shoot North America nebula. Um, so I, I think at that stage, I wasn't really good with plate solving, didn't really know the concept of plate solving, uh, but uh, using the remote on the, uh, the mount, I pointed to North America, but I think I got the other side of the galaxy. So here on the left slide, you see the Milky Way, North America is on this side. I somehow got on this side and I, this is the image I got through the ED140. And you're going to see the fox head cluster. It looks like a fox if you rotate, you know, the head of a fox. Uh, so it was killing two birds in one stone. You know, I found 
accidentally kind of found this but then i over like superimposed my image going to worldwidetelescopes.org so you could you can upload your image and it'll tell you where you're shooting in the night sky it sort of plates all for you so then i think after this i'm like i got to really shoot what i wanted to so i made another attempt at north america and this time i was on target um so you know you can see the shape of north america this is florida new york is here hudson bay la is probably here this is uh, gulf of mexico um but starting to get something out of it and and just super happy made another attempt at pallades this was in october 21 uh, this was a shot like uh, i think almost like an hour 40 minutes uh, still shooting with the mirrorless camera iso 800 196 subs 30 seconds each and there was still a lot of noise uh, you know the stars you can see are a little bit uh, stretched out here but i didn't really care you know this was fantastic candy <laughs> uh, so moving on i think just getting better uh, new year's night um, on 1st of jan 2022 i got the first smudges of the rosette nebula uh, again a lot of i think i was because i was not dithering at this stage there was still a lot of uh, noise um, 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 walking noise which you can really see here and again the exposure is only hour and a half so it was not i think the full details of the rosette was were not really showing but uh, at this stage i'm still i think a, a beginner <laughs> so really happy with this and made another attempt at the orion after that in january um, so you can really see the progression of you know from one sub uh, about 6 months before this and up to this image and this is when i really realized like you can start to see these filaments go all the way up running man is of is visible uh, uh my mentor jim was really instrumental at this stage and he i think uh i was starting to learn that uh imaging is almost as crucial as processing i mean it, it like in golf if you cannot putt then you don't you know go into the hole <laughs> so so i've i think really paid more attention to processing since then and you know, uh, uh starting to i think make some headway now so moving on i finally i think pointed to another target in the sky horsehead and flame nebula this was in also in january of this year actually so about you know 10 months ago um still some issues because of uh, the bottle eight or nine uh, site but um, starting to get uh, some detail here i think i'm planning to shoot this again pretty soon um, with some new accessories i have this is the cigar and board galaxies uh, always up over the horizon and uh this is a total of 6 hour almost like a 7 hour integration time and i mean i i kept shooting this i think this is my third attempt at cigar and boards and really started to the details within the cigar are starting to emerge and you can see i think some of the the details within the boards galaxy as well so <clears throat> pretty happy with this and then i think the galaxy season just opened up after that in in uh, early uh, like uh, you know uh, prior free spring of 2022 uh, uh whirlpool uh, pinwheel and then sunflower um i thought i just fell in love with sunflower um it is about 3 and a half hours of uh, integration time but i think really the details came out uh, by processing so i'm using deep sky stacker pull the image out from that and then uh get uh, bring it into photoshop uh with some other plugins and uh you know just just continuing to refine within so this is uh, going from the light polluted los angeles to uh joshua tree so i i heard a lot about joshua tree 
dark sky site. I'm like, okay, let's go. You know, let's uh, make an attempt at see what we got. So this is uh, uh, like a it's a boot docking site, which is, means that you don't really go into the park. Uh, you can there's a region outside of Joshua Tree on the south side, you know, by the ten freeway where you can just go and park. And they are little they look like campsites, but you don't need a reservation. So me and my friend, you know, we just uh, like let's let's uh, go there and experiment what it looks like. So this is the ED140 race against time to set the scope up before sundown. And uh, the sand at Joshua Tree is really interesting. It is you know, not the powdery sand, but the kind of real like granular. So the the I had the anti vibration pads here, which were pretty stable. You know, things they were not moving. So I was, I didn't have any concrete blocks. So I was kind of worried uh, how this would, you know, uh, settle into the ground, but it worked pretty well. Um, this is me wrapping up uh, in the morning with, you can actually see the guide scope. Uh, that's the ASI Air Plus right here. And uh, wrapping up, but a big difference between um, my location where you know, in the middle of Los Angeles, or to class eight or nine to uh, Joshua Tree. You know, the numbers are completely off the charts. Um, and this is from light pollution maps uh, dot info. So you can see the brightness go from 8.10 to less than uh, 0 0.2. And I mean, when, the, when I shot and next day when I processed, I mean, I could really see the results. So let me show you what I got. So the, my first target was Sombrero Galaxy. I shot this for about three hours um, on the south side. Um, and also Eagle Nebula. So this is Eagle, which is about a couple of hours. So you can really see the pillars of creation in the center. And all of these images are without um, any light pollution filter filters used because in Joshua Tree and Bottle, Bottle Tree. Um, so really super happy with this, um, but um, so just a quick uh, technical rundown here. Vignetting disappeared completely because there was no light pollution. Uh, I was not using a filter at all, ASIR plus to control the mount and the scope. Uh, guiding, I was I achieved pretty well at my level, which is 0 0.8 arc seconds. I think these days I'm at about 0.4 or 0.3 which is pretty substantial improvement, uh, happy with, with that. And I was dithering at the time. So dithering took care of the walking noise. Uh, every five uh, frames, I had uh, procured a, an automatic focuser, which sort of fo focuses automatically for you, connected to the ASI Air Plus. Uh, the mount was stable, and as I just shared, there was a slight breeze for about four to five miles an hour, but it, it was, uh, it was a great experience. Really spoiled after this experience, I decided to go back to Joshua Tree in, in three months, or actually three weeks. And this time I had a slightly different setup because uh, just learned that um, wide field shots would probably be uh, a little different from the ED140's zoomed in view. So I had uh, at that time a, um, a Red Cat 51. Um, William Optics connected to the same mount and there's a camera in the back, uh, the guide scope is the guide camera. This is the road into the uh, Cottonwood campground, which is the, the darkest campground in Joshua Tree. This is about, I think, border Bordel three. Um, and this is a sunset as I'm waiting for, you know, after setting up the scope um, to do the imaging. And some of the results which I got, Come up in a second. So this is Ro of Yuki, uh, or Ro of Yuchi, I believe. Uh, it's a pretty wide target. Um, and these two uh, dark uh, nebulous arms go and meet the Milky Way. And I've always wanted to shoot this because of the, the I mean, some of the images on Astrobin I saw with all of these beautiful colors and just, just a, a variation of targets within this image. So you can see, I think this is like, I believe M4 up here, a cluster with 100,000 stars, the row of Yuki stars. Uh, uh, 
in, in within the nebulous clouds. And, and I believe this is about 95 light years wide. Um, so just really happy with the results. Um, I think by this stage of May of uh, this year, this was my best uh, attempt and image. But I had some time left, same night. So I pointed the scope towards uh, the center of the Milky Way and got a lagoon and Triffid uh, nebulae. Um, this is only a two hour shot, a one hour, 48 minutes, total integration time. But you can see the kind of detail I got here. And this really reinforced my belief that, I mean, you, in, you really have to go back to a dark sky site to, <laughs> to get, you know, really get these, these gems show up. Um, any kind of filter used would, would kill half, half the light. <clears throat> Um, since then, I have not had an opportunity to go back to Joshua Tree, but shooting stuff from my backyard. So this is uh, using, a, I think, a broadband filter, the Vale Nebulae, uh, using the same scope, uh, uh, because this, I think this uh, FOV will not fit within the ED140. Uh, so this is the entire, um, I guess, Eastern and Western Vale uh, supernova remnant, because this, these two uh, nebulae formed a blast ring, which I guess a star exploded about 10 to 20,000 years ago. Um, and this is my latest image, just taken a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, heart and soul. Uh, now I have a new weapon in my arsenal. <laughs> uh, it's the Antlia gold filter. So it's a filter meant specially for emission nebulae, um, a dual narrowband. And I'm really starting to see the, the, the clarity and the advantages with this. You know, this is shot from border of mine. Um, but again, it's, I think there are some limitations because it's, uh, it's meant for emission nebulae only. Uh, so at least I have the whole class of emission nebulae covered from my light polluted backyard. So yeah, I think the journey continues. <laughs> and I would say, you know, credits to my parents, my better half, Scott and team, absolutely. Uh, my mentor, Jim, and some of my friends who have uh, helped me, you know, have accompanied me and patiently waited and slept in the tents while I shot <laughs> while I shot. Uh, going away with this uh, slide, this, these are my desired days of retirement. You know, <laughs> this is a, a poster in my room and I really wish this comes true. <laughs> Thank you very much. for you. Uh, yeah. I know you're an architect. Um, how do you find that um, amateur astronomy has influenced your work or does it, uh, and, and also I guess the second question is, how does amateur astronomy help you, like, you know, if you've had a tough day? Or something? Right, right, right. So let me answer the latter part of, of your okay. question first. So architecture is a pretty challenging profession. <laughs> you know, I've been in it for about 20 years. I'm a, I specialize in healthcare design. And in California, there are the new uh, requirements on seismic safety. Uh, there is Senate Bill 1953, which, which really uh, requires all hospitals all over the state to be seismically compliant for general acute care. And facing those challenges in the office, I love my work. Um, but it's stressful you know, when you work with a team and you know, there are other sort of unknown challenges which come about almost every day. Come home and I'm like, okay, I gotta go out. I gotta go in, in the backyard, open up you know, this thing. And, and I'm sitting out there for three or four hours. I, I hear the owls in the, in the, in, in the trees or you know, once in a while a cat kind of scares me, but it's, it's therapy. You know, I think, this is such a such an amazing um, um, field, um, I would say, or, or a hobby. It's uh, so personal. At the same time, it's everybody is part of it. You know, you look up and you see the same thing as I'm seeing, thousands of miles away. So I am very blessed. I feel, I mean, to be able to reach this level and to be able to do this in this lifetime. Uh, I'm just very, very grateful. And uh, also when I share this with my team, you know, in the offices, like I recently started uh, 
uh, I, I had a change of jobs and everybody's eyes just light, light up. So what that does is it creates a camaraderie within the team. Uh, you know, the sense of competition or competitiveness goes down. Um, and every, almost every week I've been bothered is like, so have, do you have any more images to share with us? Yeah. So I think it, 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 it is a therapy on multiple levels. It really is. And, and I, I do hope, and it's a never ending uh, Wikipedia of, uh, of targets. You know, I'll continue to do this till uh, if I'm blessed to live up to 80 and 90. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just very, very grateful and, and, uh, you know, thank you to you, Scott, for, oh, thank you. for, you know, this, this lighting that fire, uh, and helping me. So, so. yes, sir. Uh, no, <laughs> I have my cell phone camera, but, but, uh, <laughs> Right. What do you recommendations and what is the best option? Um, you know, I personally have only known Photoshop. I know there are you know a bunch of other uh, softwares out there. Uh, I have used Photoshop quite a bit uh, in my profession earlier, so I think it helped. But some of the tips and tricks which I continue to learn, I have. Uh, I think some folks have had a sort of a one. Uh, the one shot uh, uh, license, but I have a subscription, like monthly subscription of Photoshop, which is, I think yearly it's about 120 for the Adobe suite, which is pretty okay. It was like, well, 10 bucks a month. And that does is it, they continue to add tools that send you sort of tutorials. But the, I think in a nutshell, what I would say is Deep Sky Stacker, you have a 200 or let's say 171 or 200 megabyte image processed in or a stacked. You bring it in, you just do your color balance to you know get all the colors together and then play with levels basically. You just shrink the level so that you just have the, the peak and continue to do that many, many, many steps. But I do feel there are some plugins which really help, you know, the Astro, the Annie's Astro Tools is a big one, uh, which really helps in, I think, enhancing DSO and and reducing stars and a bunch of other, uh, I think, uh, uh, tools to reduce noise. Um, there are some other uh, plugins which um, help with uh, uh, enhancing the image. The, the rasterization effect becomes more smooth. So I use them uh, uh, definitely. But it's just, um, how should I explain it? It's like, I think at the end of the day, it's like a potter playing with clay with time. You know, it's a, it's a craftsmanship. You, know, you, you tend to, I guess, polish and refine over time. And, and I'm still, a, still in the very beginning stages. So, um, so yeah. But thank you for the, yes, ma'am. It's a so Canon had made I think a couple of years ago they were selling Canon EOS R A so R Canon EOS R is pretty common <clears throat> but they had an astrophotography version R A A for astrophotography and the I, I guess the only thing was they had a UV IR cut filter uh, embedded within the camera which I use um, it's been pretty great. Um, I also use it sometimes during daytime. It has a slightly reddish, you know, tinge on the images, but you can easily adjust them in Photoshop. Uh, but it's a fantastic camera. I think uh, Canon stopped making them uh, suddenly, I heard like six months ago. Um, but there are some other alternatives. I think I'm with Nikon and, and uh, there's another brand I forget. Uh, but I love one shot color. I think mono is another world. Uh, I will, I guess, eventually get to. But right now, I'm pretty happy with <laughs> with my results and, and just uh, I I went to India about six months ago and took out all these images, published a book on Shutterfly, and gifted it to my parents. So they were pretty pretty happy. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you for for the great questions.
I'll bring the camera next time if I'm. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. So up next is Cameron Gillis. And Cameron did a series on our program. I think he did like 80 programs, something like that, uh, called uh, Camstronomy. <laughs> Only 20, is that right? <laughs> so anyhow, um, uh, but uh, he, he, was, he was on quite a bit, uh, in fact, more than almost anyone else. And so we really appreciate the contribution he made to uh, the amateur community and all the rest of it. But we got to watch Cam Cameron really kind of uh, progress in the way that he was logging in his observations and kind of making this system of, uh, of observing, uh, taking an image, you know, we watch his, his uh, quality of his images grow, you know, and he's doing it all on a smartphone. He's doing it from the balcony in Seattle. Okay, super light polluted. And he's out there doing astronomy. And I cannot tell you how many hundreds of amateur astronomers that, that don't do anything, because they go, oh, the sky's not right. It's it's too light polluted. Uh, things conditions aren't just, you know, what I want. Okay, and they'll wait for that one month or every other month because they're too darn busy, you know, in the regular lives, and they don't get the kind of astronomy in that they could. And what makes you a better astronomer than really the next guy is how often you do it, you know. So, um, and uh, when you work at it like Cameron did, you get really intimate with the sky. And so he was taking us on this path. It was like we're hiking through the woods or something as we're going through the Milky Way, going from deep sky object to deep sky object, star cluster to star cluster. Uh, it was really cool. And so, um, you know, I, I have a lot of appreciation for Cameron uh, for his devotion to putting that series together. Uh, I want to thank his wife for putting up with it as well, you know, because I know he spent a lot of time away. And um, it's really <laughs> nice to have Cameron here still sharing his love for astronomy and, uh, and coming all the way to Mount Wilson to do it live with us. So thank you, Cameron. It's all yours, man. Thanks. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I have to pinch myself, but I have to admit that I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, you know, you've been do, I've been doing this for a couple of years now with the Zoom, but now being here in this vulnerable place and uh, and seeing you all here and uh, you know having Scott meeting people in person, it's a real real honor. So uh, I'm really uh, really enjoying this. This is this is really great. So and Ansel, that was your story is just fantastic. I I just love that. It just speaks to my journey as well because uh, you know when COVID hit, right? Uh, I I just I started getting back into astronomy again, and um, you know, after many years, and I, and uh, it's uh, it, it's been very very nice. So this community and and everyone here, it's uh, uh, it's it's really nice to to, have, to to be here. So with that said, um, you know, I don't want to be uh, too presumptuous here, but I actually uh, have a proposed observing plan for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it's one of those things, you know, I've never done this with a, an observatory class instrument, but, you know, you, you have to look at the flow. You want to have it relaxing. You don't want to, you know, I, my, my first reaction is like, oh, I want to see, you know, hundreds of objects, right? Uh, and um, and I would love to just swing that scope around. But you have to think about settling time. Everyone wants some time with the IP. So you want to really uh, drink it in. So I, I, I have a plan here which um, is only talking about 10 objects for tonight, giving us you know, a good half an hour. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's up for grabs, but just a, a suggestion. And, um, and if we have some extra time, obviously, if we can look at a couple of other objects, that would be a bonus, of course. So um, let me, um, and I'm gonna try something new here that I haven't done before. I, I used to have my ASI, sorry, my um, Sky Safari app, uh, on on a uh, uh, on stacks uh, uh, on a um, on a software on the PC, but I actually found a way that I could mirror my screen on my tablet, 
and I can actually control it. So I'll, I'll, I'll do some navigation that way. So let's uh, just. So here's the uh, kind of the overview. And so this is at, uh, at uh, 1130 at night where Jupiter's close to op opposition and uh, you know, the moon is right there as well. So this is basically a summary. You know, we start off actually with Pluto and then work our way to, uh, to Mars uh, uh, in, in the early morning. And uh, basically uh, I was able to, Sky Surfer, I cannot say enough about Sky Surfer. I think that really, you know, when I got back in, into astronomy uh, again, um, a couple of years ago, uh, this app was in prime and uh, I'll tell you, it's really changed uh, the whole workflow and, and the enjoyment. So, so I was able to come up with, uh, with a proposal here. Uh, we're definitely gonna see all the outer planets. So starting uh, Pluto, uh, Saturn, and then it happens to be the Saturn Nebula right beside it. So it's like, why not, right? And uh, then we have M15, uh, we've got to have a globid cluster. I, when you look at the scale, uh, the eyepiece image scale, it's like, wow, it's going to fill the entire field of view. It's going to be incredible. I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, then we have Stefan's Quintet. I figured, we, you know, with web, uh, you know, that web image with, uh, even though we have full moonlight, I think with the, with the 60 inch, uh, you should still be able to pick it out. Uh, and then uh, Andromeda. Andromeda, of course, uh, because of the history of this play uh, of Mount Wilson, um, that's where that CIFID variable was. So we'll see if we can uh, get zoomed in into that particular part of Andromeda. And then, uh, and then we come back down. And uh, when I was doing this uh, planning, I was like, hmm, you know, uh, I, I just happened to discover, I looked at Jupiter, I was like, I had to look at, all right, Io is transiting. Uh, Jupiter. So we're going to see uh, at 1130. That's why we're saving Jupiter till uh, between 11 and, and midnight tonight. Uh, Io is transiting and it's going to go right across. And of course, you have the shadow there as well. And the great, great red spot just happens to be uh, there as well. So it, it's going to be nice. And of course, we have to look at the moon, the thing, uh, and, and then we're going to go to um, uh, Uranus. Uh, Neptune, sorry, Neptune and Uranus and Mars. And the neat part about all the outer planet, the smaller ones that even though it may be a small disk is they have a lot of moons you can actually see. And I, uh, I'll show you some of the uh, plate solves that I have, uh, which shows the moon orientation of all the, uh, the outer planets. And that's, that's uh, you know, I think, uh, for example, in Mars, when we get to that, that slide, you'll see um, uh, both Deimos and, and, and uh, Phobos uh, are actually 16th magnitude, I think. So you should be able to pick it up with a, with a 60 inch. Um, but let's see, let's see, that will be part of the fun. Okay, so, uh, so looking at Pluto, what I have is I, I, I have, um, actually, I wanna back up a little bit. Um, the reason why I have these slides is uh, I wanna give uh, Jeff Weiss uh, a lot of credit, uh, you know, he reached out to me because uh, about a year ago, uh, we were actually gonna be going to Mount Wilson uh, for a, a visit that he was arranging. And unfortunately, because of the fires uh, that had to be canceled. Uh, but, uh, but I did a lot of planning for that one and I was able to reuse uh, some of that. And uh, so I, I, again, I, I thank you, Jeff, for, for that. Uh, it's been, you've been great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so the interesting part about Pluto, even though you're not going to, it's going to be stellar, uh, is I don't know if we can do this, but we might be able to pick out Sharon, uh, and that's the orientation. So when we look through the eyepiece, uh, you'll see the field of view. I put in a 55 millimeter plossel because uh, I know there was some set, but I, now that I saw uh, that we're going to have a beautiful uh, 30 millimeter, 100 degree eyepiece, it's like, well, forget about that. We're just going to go to that. I, th I think we're going to keep that eyepiece in there the whole, <laughs> the whole time. So uh, thanks to Scott, he's going to bring, uh, ha have that eyepiece there. So, but it's about the same field of view as the, as the 55 millimeter plus. And, and, um, and uh, so you'll see that scale. So if we will, we'll be able to see Sharon possibly, then uh, 
uh, Saturn is going to be beautiful. Oh my gosh. I mean, uh, you're going to see all the, the moons and we'll be able to identify them with this. When we are actually at the eyepiece, I'll have my, my tablet so we can, you know, we can uh, identify them and do some visual identity. And there happens to be, you know, I love galaxies. Um, so it's like, hey, I wonder, you know, even with the full moon and all that, I wonder if we can pick out this, uh, this galaxy. Uh, I think it's around 14th or 15th magnitude uh, PCG ending in 733 uh, in between this. So let's see if we can catch that. Um, then we have the Saturn Nebula. This is a poor uh, um, picture of it, uh, but basically uh, that will be really nice. There's actually, in fact, now is a good time for me to um, try out my little experiment. So I'm going to... So what you can do for those, so what I'm doing, this is actually good for, for anyone out there who wants to use your tablet and then just a screen image uh, if you have Sky Safari and have it in running in native mode on your tablet. And that's, that's a lot faster than trying to do an emulator on your PC. Cross our fingers here. Let me just test this out. What is the name of that? It's just, it's an actually Windows app. It's, it, you just type in the search, just type in connect and that's it. So that's what is really nice about it. You don't have to do anything fancy with it. There we go. So now the beauty is, as you can see, it, it works, it's very responsive, right? And uh, so now I can zoom in. So let's go actually, we were, we were at Saturn Nebula here. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay, of course. But basically, if we look at that guy, this, this is more what we're gonna probably see uh, tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that with the central star and some of the structure around the ANSI uh, of Saturn Nebula. So that would be fun, the namesake. So now let's go back to slides. Can you think that the 3100 is gonna look similar to what you've mapped out with the 50 plus? Yes, in fact, let me jump ahead. Let me use, I have to disconnect here. Give me a second. I'll answer that question this way. So we go, back. and then, hmm, what happened here? Ah, and show. Let me show you what it looks like. What is a good uh, Oh, so here's here's the original one I had from last year. So let me answer. I'm going to actually answer it live. Let me put this in presentation. So this is each of these rings it represents uh, and this is with the proper focal length. I, I, at the time I I had the the rounded numbers for the focal length and the aperture at 2400 and, and oh, sorry at uh, 1500 and 2400 respectively but then i since found that you know that's actually uh, is actually a more there's a more accurate numbers that scott shared so this is what i had before in fact sorry i'm jumping around a little bit but i'm gonna the best way to do this best way to do it maybe this is actually a bit bigger Make this full screen. All right. I'm going to do it natively on the uh, ASIR. So, or sorry, on the uh, Sky Safari. So, that's what I love about this. Uh, you know, the the new era of presenting is. You know, there's the rough around the edges live. You know, I, I'm. Uh, okay, so here we go. So now we can see. Now, what I do is let me show you. I, if I look at my my equipment, here's Mount Wilson. So you can add this and uh, there's the actual aperture. Did I get it right? 1524 and 24384. That's the actual uh, correct numbers. So I, you put that in and then you can add the uh, Explorer Scientific 100 degree um, eyepiece. 
and that gives you, and then what you can do is you can match that. And then if you go to observe scope display, you go all the way down. So here, here's what you can do. And you can see the field of view is 0.12 degrees. Magnitude, magnification, this is amazing, 812. And, and uh, you know, I exit pupil of 1.9 millimeter. So if you combine that with, let's say the um, 55 millimeter plossal, you can see the field of view just visually 0.11. So let's put both of those guys on. And you can see, right, they're very, very similar, right? So in fact, in fact, the, uh, the 100 degrees wider at twice the magnification, right, almost twice the magnification, it has a wider field of view than the, the 55 millimeter, millimeter plus. So it's really, when you have a, a tool like the Sky Safari, it's, it's so fun, you know, on those cloudy nights, especially in Seattle, all those rainy times, you can, you can do a lot of simulation, which is really important for the hobby because the more prepared you are when you go out there on a clear night, the more enjoyable you're going to have, right? So, so, so that's that. And then what I also did, what I also did, and we'll get to this as well, is I actually brought my, um, my, my ASI Air uh, and my, um, uh, it's actually the Pro model. So it's not the Plus, it's the Pro and I got uh, two cameras. One is a 294, um, which is a four-thirds sen sensor. And then I got uh, a 120 MC, it's a planetary camera. So that, that allows you to go high frame rate. And I don't want to experiment totally. Let's see if we can set up in twilight, I'm hoping, right? And I can try the different focal distances so we can quickly switch after everyone's seen it visually. I can do a cameo shot you know, of whatever we looked at, that would be nice. But I don't know, we'll, we'll figure that out. I brought it just in case, but just to show you how that looks. Is that the 294 color camera? Yes, it's the MC, not the MC Pro. I didn't want to put in too much power. It's uncooled, but that's fine. You know, if we can do EAA, there's enough signal to noise with a 60 inch, <laughs> I think. And we're doing a lot of it planetary. So I think, but you're right, I, you know, it's, um, so let's, uh, let's show you Saturn, for example. So here's the field of view. I'll turn off the uh, 55 millimeter plossal. Go all the way down here. And then I also added the uh, 294. Uh, here's the 120. It's not the mini, but it's uh, I got the, the colored one. Um, and then I also have, where is it? Where's my 60 inch? No, 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 no. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. Thank you. Yeah, so there's the 294. So now we're going to overlay. So this is what you got. So look at the, the visually, we're going to have an absolutely beautiful wide field view with the round circle. That's going to be a visual field of view. And then when we switch to, if we switch to uh, the, the cameras, the 294 is going to be mainly used for deep sky and stuff. but for the planetary, you can see, look at this, it just frames, it's gonna be massive. So I don't know, I, I think the tracking is gonna to be totally awesome. We're gonna to see tons of atmospheric wavering, but it, it should be fun, let's, let's see. Um, so then getting back to the slides, did that answer your question? <laughs> My boss always tells me I talk too much, give too long of an explanation, but. <laughs> let's go is back. Is that Saturn Nebula similar to uh, M57 in size? Ah, let me answer that with slides. So I don't want to take you too far off the path. No, no, that's, that's, this, this is actually totally meant to be interactive. Uh, so, right here. Oh, what happened? Switch on that. There we go. So the, the dumbbell nebula, so I'm gonna answer it a different way. So the ring nebula is, is that size, the dumbbell nebula is there. And then, and then the Saturn nebula is about the same, same size as the ring nebula. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so you'll see. So you can imagine, you know, if we have time again, wouldn't you love to see the dumbbell nebula fill your 100 degree eyepiece? I mean, and then we'll, 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 we'll so let's, uh, we'll get there. So, so let's, uh, Let's continue. Okay, so yeah, 
So then we go Saturn Nebula. So this is the uh, M15 globular cluster. You've got to do that. Um, I, I love globular clusters. It, you know, when it's one of those things that you know whether it's the moon is out or or you're showing to family or whatever, it's just an amazing experience. I can I, I, mean, I can only imagine what it's like in a in the six in the 60 inch what it would look like. And so you can see that would fill the field of view of the plaza. This is Stefan's quintet. Um, you know, we've got to do that because of is paying homage to a James Webb uh, scope. Uh, let's see if what we can see. And then um, I, I put in uh, 7331, which is this neighbor, because to me it's, it's like the mini Andromeda. It looks very much like Andromeda, except further away. Uh, so that will give you the Andromeda galaxy look like in a, in a but in a 60 inch with some dust lanes and stuff. So let's, I don't know if we have time for that. That would be nice. And of course, look at Andromeda, how big it is. We can only choose, you know, I, I figure, you know, with, with slewing and all that type of stuff, we're not going to want to, you know, just roam around. We want everyone to have a good view of whatever we want to look at. So we have to choose a space in Andromeda. And I figured if we can choose where the, I think it's over here, <laughs> but I'm sure the, the observatory people and <laughs> they know um, the uh, this is this is the plate that was made on the hundred inch, I believe, right? Um, which which shows the Cepheid variable uh, right there. Year yeah, in the 99th anniversary. Yep, and so. Uh, so if we can, that would be an amazing thing. And then there's there's some good structure to see around there, but it just, that means so much, you know, it's like we used to think that the earth was the center, of course, and then the sun was the center and then the galaxy was the center. And now it's like, okay, <laughs> that's that's all out, literally out the window. It's very profound, uh, this this discovery. And, and I think Scott has said it before, can you imagine being the only person on earth to figure that out? knowing the era that they were living in when people didn't have any idea, right? They weren't even, so that's a real privilege. And I, I think it's, uh, I think it's awesome what we're doing in today to get more and more people to be aware of, you know, where we are in the universe. This is an image I took with my eight inch um, and um, identifying where that safe it was. So I figured if I can take a, an image with an eight inch McCasa green, uh, you know, then, you know, the 60 inch should be awesome. So, so this is where it is. Now we're moving on to uh, Neptune. And again, what, what I find fascinating is I think Neptune will be large enough if I switch to uh, So that's a Windows all Windows equipment. All all Windows PCs have Connect. Yeah, so you just type in Connect from the search menu. Bang, it comes up with this thing. And then literally, if you've done, uh, if you have Chromecast at home or whatever, uh, you 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 do when you cast the PC. You end up with uh, uh, you just go smart view or whatever, and you can actually this is, and then it just casts the screen. So now if I go to Neptune, and zoom back out. Okay. So now what you see with Neptune, it's 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 one of the it's very far out there. So but if you keep in zooming in here you can actually see as a disc. So it's uh, magnitude 7.8, just beyond visual. Uh, but but you but when with a 60 inch, I figured, you know, with 100 inch, 100 degree eyepiece at 800 power, you're gonna be able to see a nice disc. And then you're gonna see Triton, uh, its moon, just to the, uh, the north of it. So that'll be fun. Then, Oops. 
Now we have the king of the planets, Jupiter. And like I said, I, I discovered that at 11.30 is probably the optimum time to, to observe this and giving everyone a good you know, couple minutes to, to look at this. But if you zoom in, I found out this is what it's gonna be at 11.30, smack in the middle. You're gonna see the great red, red spot. So it's just, the great red spot is just gonna move over. So by probably about midnight, it only has a 10 hour rotation, right? So by midnight, the red, side, red red spot is gone and then Io is gonna be passed. But you're gonna see the tr this transit. So this will, be, this will be something I think that will be really neat to see. And you can see if we zoom back out with, the, uh, with this field of view, it's gonna be quite, quite large. And then- uh, That's the shadow. And think about it actually. Now think about the geometry, what's going on here. Uh, Jupiter is in opposition, okay, almost. And if it was 100% opposition, the shadow should be actually directly behind the moon, right? So what's happening is it's a little bit off opposition because now you see how close the shadow is to where the moon is, right? So that, that, that's why you're able to see it. So this is perfect because if it was at op 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 opposition, you would probably wouldn't see it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you would see it on the side. Yeah, probably. So the, the moon, this white spot here, yes. Um, Io is right there. That is actually, and because of its contrast with the, uh, the, the equatorial belts, we should be able to see it even as a disc. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Let's see. I don't know if I'm setting the wrong expectations. You guys tell me, <laughs> but let's, let's see. I have a, I have a question. Will the farms and see it as lower? Yes. Are they still the, the remnants of the shoemaker? Well, I, I, yeah, actually, that's an interesting thing. Um, well, I had a six inch reflector at the time, Newtonian, when, when Shoemaker Levy um, impacted Jupiter. And I, I had just got good enough to use, learn how to use it, that I was able to observe it with my, myself. And that was absolutely astounding to see those blemishes, right? Those big black spots hitting. Uh, but anyway, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think obviously that, that they're long gone, but you could actually see them and then you could see them also get, get shrunk over time. So, yeah. So then now we have uh, Uranus. Uh, I like the way the Spanish pronounced it. So we don't have all the jokes and stuff. Uranus, yeah, that's, that's a nice way to say it. <laughs> So uh, Uranus, um, it basically you can see all of its moon, and because Uranus is on its side, all the moons are circulating like around it. And, and so that's, that's really neat. So we should be able to see that. And then finally Mars at the end of the night, uh, I, was, I was like, yeah, you could probably see the moons possibly. I, I don't know. Uh, they're, they're 16th magnitude and uh, Mars is, you know, it's still a ways away from opposition, but it's, it should be nice and big enough. So we'll, we'll be enjoying that. So, so ah, the poles, uh, they, depending on the season, right now, I think it's, it's uh, you won't see it very much, it's a very small amount. Like when I think uh, a couple of years ago, when I when it was at opposition, uh, you could just see a tiny bit, but there was one point where, where they actually would have a season and, and it was quite quite a large one, but I hadn't seen that. Yeah, it will be small. And then I have a couple of, uh, uh, you know, you notice one thing that's obviously missing is the moon. So we, we need to make a, a decision when we're close, when we're Jupiter, around Jupiter time, uh, observing Jupiter, we wanna decide where on the moon we want to look because we definitely want to see the moon. I, I've heard that it's absolutely amazing, especially with a hundred degree eyepiece. Um, you can see it takes a big chunk. Um, it's going to be too small, too zoomed in for the uh, the imaging. So just just visually will be will be wonderful. So we have a couple of different locations which we can choose. I just randomly I chose a couple of features, um, but we can decide on that. And then I just wanted to overlay again the image scale. You can see with Jupiter that 
you know, with, with a planetary camera that is, is even too big for that. So I think Saturn is perfect. Um, and then just, just some more image scale references. So let's skip ahead. Oh, if we have time, I don't know. Another beautiful galaxy, if we can see it, is uh, NGC 891 that has the dust lane. Uh, I don't, uh, let, let's see if we can see that. And that would be a, a really nice, you can see it with the uh, 100 degree eyepiece, almost the entire uh, length of, uh, with the dust lane. And, and as, as I mentioned, I think if I can swing it, it would be wonderful to take an image of Saturn with the planetary camera. Camera, We're going to be able to see it on video and, um, and it will fill the entire field, as you can see here, perfectly. And, and then this is just, uh, you, know, you know, I saw Ansel's uh, nice slides about <laughs> the, the rig he has. This is what the rig I'm, I'm working with. Um, it's just an 880 millimeter, the good old ED80, right? It's a nice, uh, and I wanna, again, I wanna thank uh, Jeff. Jeff taught me the way of the alpha axis guider. In fact, uh, very kind of him. He, uh, that's his off-axis off guider. And uh, I managed to get, it took, a, it took me a while to figure that out, but I got it. And uh, now I've, this thing has been singing really nice now. I just got it set up and optimized. I got my dew heater ready for the winter because it, in, in Seattle, it just gets really heavy dew. So you absolutely need to have that. And then uh, the new uh, uh, finder. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice system. It's light enough. You can see where the counterweight is. It's way up there. It's just a single counterweight. So it's a nice light system. I can just pop out. And again, the ASI Air, oh my gosh. I have, what I've done is I've connected the ASI Air. Uh, we just recently got a, a home mesh router. And this is another advice for everyone out there. Home mesh routers are, um, are a really awesome way to be wired, but also wireless. Uh, between the inside and outside of your house. So what you can do is you can take your a mesh router, stick it on the outside, run your ethernet cable to it, and it's meshed to the inside. And then you have the, the high bandwidth, right? Because they're using a different frequency on, on the backhaul for the mesh router. And that's giving you like three gig, right? Which is, which is plenty compared to normal. So when I, when I do my live imaging with my ASI Air, it's getting like 12 megabits per second download speed. So it's really a high upgrade update. Then I'm working on my other rig because I, I started off with, um, with an evolution um, uh, eight inch. Uh, and then I said, you know, what? I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get this thing up and running so I can do imaging with it as well. So I got myself a equatorial wedge. And then I also have a, a wide field like you know, Ansel is right on. The, the wire field is awesome. So I have that getting, it's not all working yet, but it's, uh, I'm just working on it. And then I have my eight inch, tons of wires, but I have to optimize that. So um, so that's why uh, it's taking a while, but I ultimately want to do a, a deep, uh, deep sky survey with, on all the galaxies, but I also want to do wide field uh, as well uh, on the constellation level. So that's basically it. So I went around, did a lot of stuff. So any questions or? What is it? Oh, oh, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> uh, so Ansel, yeah, how many rigs? Uh, so going back, basically one, two, right? Uh, three. Uh, rigs that I want to op have optical assemblies, and then I have two physical mounts. Uh, those, so I could have two. My goal is to have two mounts running, one wide field, one deep, simultaneously. I was trying a piggyback, as you remember in my earlier talks. I was trying to piggyback, and I said, no, 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 no. You're, you're not going to do a wide field just because of the the framing. You're not going to get the the wide field and the deep one at the same time. It was kind of neat. It was a good experiment, but I realized no. I want to independently control. So I have three scopes and then, and that way I don't have to play around with the imaging train as well. When I, when I put them on a different rig, I can move them around. Yeah. And I'm getting myself an X, a second ASI that I can have uh, both of them running on tablets. Yeah. How many nights in Seattle do you get? Well, you know, if, 
if it wasn't for the smoke right now, I would it would have been awesome, right? But but uh, the on the average winter time, even though you get dark earlier, I might get one or two nights over four months. Yeah, and then and then and then the summertime. Uh, so you really want to get everything ready, right? And you want to maximize it. So, uh, and then in the summertime, though, it, it's quite good. So you, you might get a batch of 10 nights, you know, over a couple of months. So it's not too many. So you really, uh, that's another reason why I want to do this automation because, uh, you know, I want to be able to set up my rig so that I can go to bed and it just takes advantage of that when it's a clear night, I can take advantage all night right to the morning and then have all my images in the morning and that's another reason why i'm getting these dew, dew heaters because my gosh it doesn't take long within two hours you're you're all wet uh, especially in the winter time so i got one of those for the, my my c8 i got one of those new um uh, you, you can't see it but it's it's actually the one that fits that's purpose built on the on the corrector plate and uh, that really helps Any other questions? So, all right. Well, thanks everyone. Yep. Oh. Okay. Well, we've got a meal order, okay, and uh, we're going to go get it. But uh, not a surprise for you. So, um, Chris, is, Chris Burns is going to uh, get a donut first. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to follow Chris out onto the observatory area. And we're going to wait for our samples to show up. And, uh, and I think you're going to like uh, what's coming up. So, okay. Let's break. Take them to the hundred inch for them to look around. Okay, you know. just looking around, waiting for sound. Yeah. Hello? And for those of you watching online with us, thank you very much. Uh, we will come back with uh, more talks later, but uh, our uh, audience is now uh, going to take a, uh, they're getting a special surprise. We'll talk about it later. Um, next year, uh, when we do the Mount Wilson event, uh, you should come. Uh, it's, it is, uh, it's meant to give you a lasting impression. So thanks for watching, and we'll be back probably in about an hour or so, okay?